Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Craig Scott. I'm the Director of Preservation and Research here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. On behalf of the Royal Tyrrell Museum Cooperating Society and the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2024 Royal Tyrrell Museum Cooperating Society Speaker Series. As a reminder, the uh, Cooperating Society is a nonprofit charitable organization that supports research, educational programming, exhibits, and local community initiatives through the management of the museum shop and the administration of donations and memberships. The Cooperating Society plays a key role in helping the museum achieve its mandate, including supporting the speaker series. Well, before we begin today, I would be remiss in not acknowledging begrudgingly Velociraptor Awareness Day. <laughs> Mercifully, today's talk will make no mention of this highly overrated pipsqueak dinosaur. Um. I stand corrected. We may be hearing about Velocir <laughs> Velociraptor today. <laughs> okay, so now on to more interesting things. I'm delighted to introduce this morning's speaker for the 11th talk of our speaker series, Dr. John Hunter. John is an associate professor in the Department of Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology and the School of Earth Sciences at The Ohio State University. He graduated in 1997 with a PhD in Functional and Evolutionary Morphology under the supervision of Professor David Krauss at the State University of New York at Stony Brook in the Department of Anatomical Sciences. While studying with Dr. Krauss, Dr. Hunter established his field paleontology program focused on late Cretaceous and Paleocene mammalian faunas in North America. Dr. Hunter was a postdoctoral fellow from 1996 to 1997 and assistant professor from 1997 to 2004 in the Department of Anatomy at the New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine. He has been at The Ohio State University since 2004. He is a vertebrate paleontologist with long-term interest in the causes behind the diversification and extinction events that have punctuated the history of life. He's published influential studies on key innovations, that is to say the traits that impact ecology and promote diversification of morphological diversity as a tool for studying long-term evolutionary trends and the use of the fossil record to determine the likely time and place of origin of modern placental mammals. He has led multiple expeditions to North Dakota and Montana to collect vertebrate fossils of late Cretaceous and Paleocene age detailing the record of dinosaur and other vertebrate occurrences during the last one million years of the Cretaceous. He is currently exploring the relationship between tooth development and variation in tooth shape in modern humans, specifically testing the hypothesis that human teeth vary essentially along lines of genetic lease resistance. And this work has significant implications for predicting the likely direction of evolutionary change. The talk this morning, titled Teeth and Mammalian Evolution, will discuss some of John's field projects in Montana and North Dakota, focusing on extinction scenarios and the relation to some of the research conducted here in Alberta, before pivoting to bigger picture issues of mammalian dental evolution and the links between dental development and mammalian diversification. And so with that out of the way, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. John Hunter, to the podium. So uh, first, let me thank you for inviting me here today, uh, especially uh, Craig for hosting me as we um, look at how different ways that um, we can mutually support each other's work. Um, I chose just a few images to get started with, uh, which kind of reflect very, various aspects of, of what I do, because kind of I like the iconography. Some of you might uh, um, recognize the only figure in Darwin's Origin of Species, which do does double duty to um, uh, represent evolutionary lineages with the origin of new species from ancestral species, and does double duty with um, representing um, genealogies within populations as well. Um, and I find myself more often than not trying to jump um, scales um, as, as much as possible, whether the work be in the fossil record or with living populations. Um, and I've been working with some anthropologists at Ohio State to look at human dental variation, and that's a little Cretaceous mammal from Mongolia, a complete skeleton. I never work on anything like that. 
the kinds of fossils I work on from North America are almost always fragmentary. And I, I struggle um, to pull as much information as I can out of fragmentary material, which is why I end up trying to really, really focus on what we can learn from teeth. So um, before I worked with Dave Krauss, the son of Southern Alberta that some of you may know for my dissertation, I had already had a couple of other mentors who were really kind of um, uh, in some formative experiences. I, I, I worked with Christine Janis at, uh, as an undergraduate, actually on a project with dinosaurs. And I haven't done much with dinosaurs since then. Um, but it kind of gave me a, um, a, a, an entry to the world of looking at teeth and diet. Um, and and uh, it was actually in the uh, Myosaur uh, uh, growth series. Um, I ended up spending a year on a Fulbright in Finland working with this Viking looking gentleman, Mikael Fortelius, on a study uh, that started off as a broad look across uh, mammals and the, the convergent evolution of bilophodonty, which you see in tapirs and kangaroos. But I ended up publishing work with Mikael on pigs from, from uh, the Miocene of Turkey. Um, and then it was with Krauss that I started to work on um, Cretaceous and Paleocene mammals. So um, even though um, my research has a, has a number of different foci, um, today I'm going to be talking about two things primarily. Um, Fieldwork related discoveries from expeditions that I was a part of or led between the early 90s through the early aughts. And um, I've chosen some um, studies to focus on because they actually relate in one way or another to the work being done here in southern Alberta or at the museum. And um, I, I, it's hard to give a talk in Drumhell or at the Tyrell without beginning with fieldwork. Um, and I'm going to segue to um, kind of broader picture um, studies of tooth evolution. Uh, starting with some earlier classic studies and, and some current work that's actually um, um, un under review right now. Um, so let's move along. Um, and this kind of introduces both aspects of what I do, both the field and, and the kind of more tooth related stuff. Teeth have a lot of information in them. Um, we can use teeth to um, uh, look for the identity of um, organisms. We can base species lineages on them, on the morphology of, uh, of teeth. Um, we have, can get a good idea of how many different kinds of mammals were present, either in species diversity or in, in morphological diversity using some methods that I and others have, have uh, developed. Um, we can use them, there's a lot of phylogenetic information in them from which we can reconstruct lineages and a lot of ecological information in them as well um, about what the animals were eating since tooth shape cl uh, closely reflects tooth, uh, the animal's diet. And what might not be apparent immediately, unless you know a little bit about tooth development, is that many of the features um, or even the sequence with which cusps form or the patterns that make a cusp when a, a tooth is nothing more than a bit of folded epithelial tissue sitting in the crypt of a jaw in a fetus or in a baby. Um, but many of those events become sort of frozen in time in the fully formed tooth that has to be fully formed once before it erupts. And so you can actually look at a tooth and reconstruct from first principles many of the events that in, in embryology and development that gave us that tooth. And armed with that knowledge, we can use um, our, our, uh, our understanding of tooth development to understand sort of broader patterns of tooth diversity. Some shapes of teeth are unlikely to form, for example. And if they are, un, uh, even if they can form, they may not last for very long because they're unstable. So over here on the left side um, are, uh, are, is sort of a summary of many of the different kinds of things that I've worked on in North Dakota and Montana, where most of my field work has been based, including Cretaceous mammals, um, uh, uh, sort of contemporaries of Triceratops and, and Tyrannosaurus and such. Um, early Paleocene mammals, middle Paleocene and late Paleocene mammals. And I've been chipping away at the sort of backlog of collections <laughs> made of ma over many years to get as many of them out um, and published before I end up retiring, which isn't going to happen anytime soon, but 
you know, it's, it's something that one begins to think about. Um, so at a, more, at a kind of a, a, a deeper level um, and with some collaborators, um, you know, Joe Hartman on invertebrates and stratigraphy, Ross Secord and Alan Kim. This is the sort of the chronostratigraphy of North Dakota where a lot of my work's been based. And the red dots over here, the PTRM localities, Pioneer Trails Regional Museum, these are uh, Cretaceous age mammal sites that are part of vertebrate sites worked on over the years by Dean Pearson of the Pioneer Trails Museum in Bowman. Um, and um, with me and, and, and others. Um, these uh, early Paleocene sites here, Peter Flats, Wilkening, Merle's Mecca. I'll be talking about a couple of these today. And that's mine, Brown Ranch, that's mine too. And all these other ones were worked by other people. And right in here, all these blue areas, if time goes from bottom to top in this figure, east is over to the right, west is over to the left, and these blue areas, of course, are seaways, um, marine rocks interposed between these um, terrestrial rocks. And the coming and goings of the western interior seaway, of course, is something that should be very familiar to um, the people who work here. Um, and going back a little bit further in time, um, one can continue to see um, these marine transgressions um, at, uh, in earlier periods of time, and inc including some, uh, some of the very familiar formations, geologic formations to, in your area. And while I uh, did not do the original field work here in the St. Mary River Formation, it was actually Jack Horner and David Weisample who explored this area for dinosaurs with the idea of seeing whether marine transgressions and the fragmentations of habitats would spur dinosaur diversification. But along the way, they found some fossil mammals um, in a dinosaur nest. Um, David Weisample passed those specimens on to um, a student at Hopkins, uh, Ron Heinrich, who is my friend and who is my friend, and um, uh, I interacted with at Stony Brook when he was a postdoc and I was a grad student there. And Ron recruited me to help him describe some of the mammals from the St. Mary River Formation. So that's kind of how I got involved in this. And one of the things I think about whether I work on uh, a place that's not been sampled very much or a place that's been like the St. Mary River Formation or the, a place that's been sampled repeatedly, doggedly for decades, pulling more and more fossils out like the Hell Creek Formation is it strongly going to influence what you find, the likelihood of finding new species, and the kinds of questions you can ask. And from a place like the St. Mary River Formation for where the, uh, in Montana, where the fossils were pretty sparse and no one had really looked there before, uh, the possibility of finding new species was quite great, and, and I was lucky. This has been, in fact, the only time <laughs> when I've been able to do things like name a new genus and species of multi tuberculate or new species of marsupials, for example, um, or another new species of a multi tuberculate. But that's pretty rare stuff. Um, more often, and most of the time, I've been interested not in um, what's happening deep in the Cretaceous, but what's happening near the end. Um, as we change from sort of dinosaur-dominated communities um, to, a commu to communities dominated by um, first primitive mammals, archaic mammals, and then their descendants. Um, and what brought me to um, uh, North Dakota and Eastern Montana was interest in that whole transition. So most of my work's been in southwestern North Dakota, uh, in the breaks of the Little Missouri River, um, near the towns of Marmoth and Bowman. This is what it looks like. Um, I always love these pictures. Um, the KT boundary is always recognized by a large yellow arrow, which you find out in the field. Um, and over a few um, years to actually almost a decade of, of collecting um, with the Pioneer Trails Museum and, and other folks, um, we ended up coming up with a summary of the work in the Hell Creek Formation um, as of the early 2000s. And my, inv oops, sorry, my involvement in this was uh, twofold, dealing with the mammals, which are all uh, these lineages on the um, far right, um, 
there, but there's data here for um, dinosaurs and, and other vertebrates through here. And these are stratigraphic levels through the Hell Creek Formation, or the last one million years of the late Cretaceous. And people from the Tyrell were involved in uh, helping the Pioneer Trails Museum with identifications. Um, at the time, Phil Curry and uh, Don Brinkman were involved. Um, my other contribution to this was um, doing some data analysis and uh, to the full data set using rarefaction because sampling intensity through the Hell Creek Formation is not even. There was a, and, and was strongly related to where the fossil bearing channels are and greater interest near the top of the formation because of interest in, in extinction issues. Um, but if you um, even out sampling intensity by rarifying down to a common sample size through the formation, what you end up with is an appearance pretty much of stable vertebrate and stable dinosaur diversity through, through that period of time. And that's something that influenced and, and found its way into various tests of extinction scenarios, um, including this one from Stephen Broussat and colleagues in 2014, um, in, in which we're reviewing dinosaur extinction from multiple scales, from the scale of the whole Cretaceous, the late Cretaceous, and just the last million years of the Cretaceous, the data set that he turned to, uh, that, well, excuse me, they turned to, um, for the kind of the finest scale um, uh, record of dinosaur occurrences until the end of the Cretaceous was ours. Um, and and I, I, I kind of feel it's a compliment to uh, have your work be use, found useful uh, by other people. Um, but uh, things did happen at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, the, the impact hit. In, nor in uh, off, off the Yucatan Peninsula. In North Dakota, um, what we see of that impact is a horizon, um, an impact horizon on the centimeter scale. It's not the meter scale tsunami deposits in Mexico, or, the th or on the other hand, the thinner um, uh, millimeter deposits on the other side of the world, but rather something uh, intermediate between those. And there is a uh, co-occurrence of all sorts of indicators of, of the impact, um, including um, irid the iridium anomaly, shocked quartz spherules. And the most useful thing, because it's more uh, prevalent throughout the whole area, is a changeover in the pollen, including a fern spike. And so we can usually tell where the key T boundary is um, with great certainty throughout the area. Um, but once you're up above that or down below that, the actual um, uh, chronostratigraphic markers become a little bit more sparse, and you rely on other things. Um, but it's kind of the repopulation of the Paleocene landscape by mammals and other vertebrates is something we can start to see unfolding in North Dakota. And um, here at this one site, which is known rather prosaically as vertebrate site V02017, and I prefer to refer to it as the Wilkiting locality because names are more memorable than numbers to me. Um, but starting after the KT event um, and above a what is sedimentologically and very locally um, represented by a sort of a ponding event where we're only getting, if the vertebrates we get are, are, are um, our aquatic ones. But soon after that, maybe within a meter, we start to get terrestrial uh, vertebrates, including terrestrial mammals. Um, samples is small, relatively small, only about 156 mammals. Um, but at least it's, it's um, the closest record we have of, of post-extinction um, uh, uh, um, repopulation of the landscape, at least locally. Now, there's a, there are localities of probably a similar antiquity and similar placement to the KT boundary in other areas as, as well, including Denver Basin and, and here as well. Um, but among the animals um, from this area, from, from this particular site, are uh, what potentially a new multi-tuberculate, and this is a, an artist's reconstruction of what it might have looked like um, on a depauperate landscape. And here's what some of the material looks like. It's, um, I'm not going to go into details with this, but uh, multi-tuberculates, if you're, if you're not familiar with the group, are a group of superficially rodent-like 
mammals. And this particular one um, is probably a boundary crosser in the broad sense, in the sense that we have uh, part of, it's part of a lineage that the ancestors, uh, uh, we have uh, the fossils from the Cretaceous. But there are others in this uh, assemblage that are probably new arrivals. But just, some, just a kind of a brief overview of some of the work here. Um, about 5,000 kilograms of matrix screen washed with a fine mesh, about 5,000 vertebrate specimens overall, and in that, um, only about 156 mammals. But the vast majority of those vertebrate specimens are, are only identifiable down to a very, very broad level. And in general, um, there are about half a dozen taxa, a little bit more known. Um, we can tell exactly um, where they come in, in terms of where we sample them anyway. A little proteutherian insectivore, primitive eutherian. Um, Mimituda and protungulatum are two um, ungulate-like mammals, but very, very primitive ungulates. Um, and then some multi-tuberculates as well. And of course, we know where uh, it's been studied for the plant uh, flora as well. As, and so we have um, some good, good um, floral data from here as well. Um, I, could, I should mention that there are um, uh, Cretaceous um, characteristic pollen that do occur well above these sites, like two and a half meters above. They're few in number. They're totally busted up, and they're almost assuredly reworked. Um, but there's no dinosaurs, no mammals that are known only from the Cretaceous. There's only boundary crossers and new arrivals, as far as the mammals go. So that's that story. Um, and here's just a few pictures of, of what it's like doing field work in North Dakota. Sometimes it's a struggle to cross a swollen little Missouri River, so you have to resort to boats. And, and we're not above getting some help from passersby. That's Tyler Lyson, at that time a student at Yale um, at the, from, from the Denver Museum, who lent us a hand getting across the river a few times, uh, for which we're grateful. Uh, oh, and here's, here is the, the 2008 crew. Um, there's me. There's Dean Pearson, a collaborator. My two grad students at the time. Uh, Deborah, I'll talk about her work in just a bit. Um, Joe Wood, and this undergraduate student now, Matt Borths, is now curator of fossil primates at the Duke Lemur Center. Um, so he was just getting his, um, and he got his undergraduate start with me in, in, at Ohio State. And he's gone pretty far. Um, so just a little bit up section, um, and um, maybe 100,000 years later. Um, we still are getting fossil mammals, and rather than a small half a dozen species, we've got a lot more. Unfortunately, here, this um, locality is still in the early stages of not collecting, because we've done a lot of collecting, but of just processing all the material. But I can give you a few highlights. First, um, a part of the fauna is, is already published, which is nice. My, my student, Deb Rook, who I pointed out to you before, um, did a master's thesis on the phylogeny of teniodonts, an archaic group of, of placental mammals in the Paleogene, but with ancestry in the Cretaceous. And the, um, uh, a, a, a fossil related to their, the, the appearance of that group is found here at the Merle's Mecca locality, or more prosaically, D99011. About, uh, it starts off about eight and a half and goes up to about 14 meters above the key T boundary. Um, it is um, well above the boundary. It's well within um, Magnetocron uh, 29R. Um, a study by Dan Pepe from a few years ago put the Cron 29, 29 normal reversal way up, I can't even get that high, um, at about 25 meters. So we're smack in the middle of that. And so we correlate to um, other uh, Puerican 1, or the first biochron, the first early biochron of the Puerican land mammal age. Um, that said, there's some kind of derived mammals in this assemblage, uh, including this one. This was found at the surface by um, museum volunteer Georgia Naus, who's now uh, a paleontologist with the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and it is a lower jaw that we recognized as um, related to a taxon 
uh, described from the Hannah Basin by Everly and the Lilligrave in years before, based on upper dentitions. And it's a form called Alvagina, or informally known as Eve for many years. Um, uh, and it was, it's thought to be a transitional form between um, proteutheria and early insectivores and these teeniodonts. And our analysis kind of bears this out with the lower dentition. The trick, though, is that the um, uh, lower dentition is not quite the same size. There's about a 10% size difference between the lower dentition and what we expect the lower dentition would be for the uppers that Everly and Lilligraven described. Um, but it was a simple matter to scale the difference and verify the occlusal fit virtually. And so that's kind of the approach we took. Um, probably the same species. Um, just 10% is, is maybe the difference between the small end and the large end of the species, but probably not enough to justify putting them in different species, at least based on the material here. And this is a, um, just a little phylogeny that Deb generated to put um, our uh, taxon based on uppers and lowers now, um, lowers from us, uppers from the Hannah Basin, in context with um, uh, early teeniodonts and um, outgroups among the uh, proteutherian insectivores. So, um, but it's not the only thing we get there. We get bones, we get um, ankle bones, astragali. Um, we get little ones, we get big ones. We get condylarths or archaic ungulates, including forms very similar to ones already described of similar age from Saskatchewan. Um, and Montana as well. And Craig, this is for you. Um, we found this, we are uh, comparing it to this from your uh, work with Dick Fox. Um, that's all I'm saying about it. All right, so at Merle's Mecca, we, or V99011 as I should say, um, we've got a wide variety of animals. Um, we're starting to see not just survivorship but diversification at that stage. Um, and while the work, the, the work in the field is complete, um, the processing of matrix from the field, from screen washing, isn't even complete. And the work continues. Um, but eventually, I think we're going to see a, a nice fauna emerge from the Merle's Mecca site. So this um, rather fearsome looking lion is, is here to remind me that it's time to segue the second part of my talk which deals with mammalian teeth. And um, mammal teeth span a great range in shape, and a lot of that range in shape is related to diet. From the um, specialized carnassial teeth for slicing meat off of bone that you see in the lion, to the um, kind of uh, broad um, uh, transverse, oh, excuse me, a longitudinal um, loafs here seen in the molars and premolars at the Cape Buffalo for grinding down fibrous vegetation. And, and we see these combined with high crown teeth um, uh, to help resist wear and increase tooth longevity. To something like the elegant barbs on the um, uh, to grow out of the crab eater seal teeth, which you, apparently uses these to filter feed for krill. Um, actually, something that wasn't really experimentally verified until very recently um, by Alistair Evans and, and his students. Um, but across that big range, tooth shape reflects tooth diet, and even beyond mammals, of course, as well. But mammals um, are the special focus here that I have. Now, a long time, my interest in the relationship between mammals, their teeth, and their diversification goes way back to this project that was sort of a side project when I was a graduate student um, that I did with Yuka Yernvall, who was a, um, a student of Mikael Fertilius's when I was in Finland. Um, but growing from conversations that began in Finland way back in the early 90s, um, Yuka and I started some collaborations. Um, one of them was on the mammalian hypocone. Now, what we're looking at here are um, up cartoons of upper molars. Um, primitively, mammals have three, uh, or uh, therian mammals anyway, have, have, that's marsupials and placentals, have three main cusps on the upper uh, molars. 
um, and then some extra little cusps as well. Um, but the, the major change that happened convergently about 20 different times among mammals, all at, most, mostly in the paleogene, predominantly in the paleogene, was the evolution of a fourth cusp. Um, which can come from different sources. It can be um, a completely new cusp, or this fourth cusp can take one of the pre-existing cusps and displace it and move it into that position. But it doesn't matter how it develops and how it evolves. Once we're there, um, it functions the same. And what it seems to do evolutionarily is that all of these derived kinds of molars, particularly among herbivores, the deer, the kangaroo, uh, the human, the rhino, and the elephant all have teeth derived in one way or another from um, an ancestor with quadratubercular four-cusp teeth, that is, with a hypocone. So it's like an intermediate stage that seems to be a prerequisite for specialized herbivory. Um, uh, looking at the distribution uh, using a very, very simple morphospace and a simple code with hypocones, without hypocones, and things that are sort of in the middle. Bats and dogs are sort of in the middle. Um, but uh, looking at the distribution of living mammals, the blue ones are the herbivores, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, the blue ones are, are the forms with hypocones, and they're predominantly among the forms with herbivores. The black ones here without a hypocone, predominantly the faunivores, and the generalists um, are a mixture. Uh, this is uh, diversity at the family level. This is diversity at the species level. Both summarize overall diversity, but in slightly different ways. Um, but there seems to be a dietary signal to having the hypocone that is bared out among in its distribution across living animals. But it's a simple morphospace space that, that um, can, can work through which we can see this. Um, and over time, and time goes from bottom to top in these figures, uh, across each of the continents, um, the world turns blue through the Cenozoic. Um, that is, we see radiations of herbivores um, with hypocones. And it was largely because of that that my colleague Yuka and I first proposed the hypocone as a key innovation in the history of mammals, um, simply by linking it to the shape of food webs. Um, it's not that having a hypocone is so special, it's that it allows herbivory, and it's the herbivores that are diverse. Um, following up on that and wanting to kind of expand our, the world's simplest morphospace to a slightly more complicated one, and um, we invented with Michael Fertilius a system for categorizing mammalian upper molars by simply counting the number of cusps and their placement and the numbers of crests and their placement. And while these look like dice, they're actually um, cartoons of, of upper molars. Um, this could be a human upper molar with four round cusps. Um, uh, this could be a mouse, and this could be a um, rhinoceros, or it could be a hyrax. They have practically identical um, upper molars in terms of shapes, even though they're very, very different in size. Um, but using this system, uh, breaking uh, uh, molar shape down to like five simple variables, um, we were able to categorize um, a large swath of fossil mammals um, through time. And back in the mid-90s, this was a time when morphological diversity as a subject was just starting to get off the ground. Um, it was uh, first coined by Bruce Roniger, uh, but it was Steve Gould who popularized the, con the concept in his book, um, Wonderful Life, about the Burgess Shale. Um, and some consider this um, the earliest, um, historically the earliest of application of morphological diversity to vertebrates. Um, but I tend to think of, of the work by Blair von Wachenberg and, and Judy Massari on guilds through time have, really have that honor, even though they didn't actually use the term morphological diversity. It's the same kind of thing. Um, you know, um, at that time, we ended up looking at three different radiations of um, hoofed mammals, the condylarths or archaic ungulates, which were my specialty, um, working in the paleogene. And my colleagues um, contributed work on the um, 
later ungulates, artiodactyls and parasodactyls, and with basically Yuka and I kind of going back and forth and, and, and um, double checking everything. Um, this is the kind of work that you do in a museum. Um, you pull out the specimens, you hold them at arm's length, you use your judgment, you categorize them, and you record it. Um, and this was before things like CAT scanners and that sort of thing. But at, at this time, we were able to have some insights into the diversification of, of, um, of ungulates of, or of herbivory. So even comparing the numbers of crown types and, and uh, the numbers of genera through time, the two um, uh, kind of reflect one another, at least initially. But there's a, an increase in the number of genera th um, in the later Cenozoic that's not reflected in the number of crown types. And to some extent, that reflects taxonomic practice. So what we're looking at here is a horn and antler radiation, um, which is not reflected in the teeth. And what we're looking at here and here is a rise in the number of taxa and the rise in the number of, of tooth crown types that's probably really driven by dietary diversification in the Paleogene, with kind of the um, peak diversity both in taxa and in morphology happening sometime in the middle Eocene, which others had um, suggested uh, as, as, as well. I'm thinking of Richard Stuckey um, at that time. So um, my colleague Yuka decided to take our data and abstract out a quantity called complexity. How many parts are present in a tooth, regardless of how those parts are arranged? And tooth type complexity has a trajectory through time. Um, it sort of plat it rises after, uh, you know, through the Paleocene and Eocene. It kind of sputters around. And these are three different continents for which we have data. This has never been done on the southern continents, by the way. Um, and uh, it's, it seems to increase through the, the later um, Cenozoic as well. And if the hypocone had never evolved in the Paleogene, it is quite likely that the complexity of mammalian teeth would have sort of remained down here <laughs> below the hypocone line. So to some extent, the hypocone is responsible or at least um, was formed at the base of uh, or made possible this kind of increasing complexity through time. In our, in our mammalian teeth. So um, over time, crown types have been used just a handful of times. Um, Yuka used them in his, in his dissertation work um, across extant mammals at the family level to infer constraints. They might be functional constraints or developmental constraints, but they're areas of morphous space that are not filled. I told you about our work here. You could then use, use them to predict the ecological impacts of future primate extinctions and they've had some advantages. They're fast, they require no special equipment, and they're repeatable. The cons, and every method has pros and cons. The cons are that they're coarse, and they're best done with actual collections. Um, because at, at least with these animals, um, we couldn't confidently crown type them from um, two-dimensional literature uh, illustrations. But there are some groups which we can. And nowadays, there are online databases of 3D images that can be rotated to come up with a more confident assessment of crown type. So it could be done a little differently nowadays. So um, this method kind of fell by the wayside as it was eclipsed. And I kind of had a little bit to do with it. Um, in the late 90s, Yuka and I started to experiment using a confocal-based method to come up with 3D models of uh, mammalian teeth. And I started doing something different. Yuka persisted with a series of postdocs, including Alistair Evans, who finally developed a, a, um, a CAT-scanned-based method of estimating complexity. And then the world was changed. Now, complexity, in this case, orientation patch count, has been uh, applied across mammals, and now it's being applied across um, other vertebrate groups, too. Um, and the main correlate um, is that uh, carnivorous mammals have teeth that are simple, and herbivorous mammals have teeth that are more and more complex. And it would seem to be a simple way to apply 
uh, or, or to um, compare carnivores versus herbivores across a broad spectrum. Um, meanwhile, just recently, my doctoral student Anessa Demers and I published a paper, it just came out in February, and uh, that puts a little bit of a shadow of a doubt on how um, broadly applicable or how broadly comparable tooth complexity by these methods is. Um, and basically what you see here is, is that the best predictor of uh, in complexity of a faunivore's tooth is an herbivore's tooth of the same, in, in the same study, usually the same biological group, same taxon. Um, and so it might be lizards down here, or it might be primates in here, or some other group in here. But there's the two main factors that seem to determine tooth complexity more than diet um, is phylogeny and, what, and the specific methods that are being used. And um, there may be some uh, improvements in the future uh, about standardizing methods um, so that at least we're comparing similar things. But in general, um, the, the, the phylogenetic aspect of it, it's interesting to me. Um, but I think ultimately phylogeny is a metaphor. What's really driving these complexity differences is how, com it's gonna sound trite, but how complex are their teeth? And what are they using their teeth for? Um, and if you think about you know, how lizards use their teeth and how mammals use their teeth, then it might be a little bit more comprehensible. Um, but it actually gives us some, some, um, some more tools to work with and think about as these tooth complexity measures get applied. Uh, and they've recently been applied to dinosaurs, for example, where they work great for ornithopods and theropods, but not so great for sauropods, as you might expect. Um, but recently, um, and kind of as a product of another grad student's um, work, um, I've started to experiment with um, tooth crown types yet again to return to them and use them as a way of characterizing the diversity of fossil primates, particularly the paleogene ones in North America, and to test um, developmental hypotheses. And I want to acknowledge my collaborators here. Um, uh, Nava Schottenstein, my doctoral student, who's now an assistant professor at Columbus State, uh, and Yuki Yerenval, who is still at the University of Helsinki. And this work that I'm presenting here is, is um, in review to be included in a Bjorn Kurten centennial volume uh, in honor of the 100th anniversary of Bjorn Kurten's birth, the mammal paleontologist from Helsinki, um, hopefully later this year. Um, and the way it developed is that my I've had a long interest in democratizing um, science with simple methods. If a simple method will suffice that anybody can use and that is accessible to anyone, um, I'll promote that over a more complex method that um, might be more sophisticated um, but is limiting or limited um, and requires special equipment. Um, Nava. Uh, her role in this is that she worked on a dissertation under my guidance on rates of morphological evolution across North American primate lineages, which I don't have time to talk about. Um, but while she was in museums measuring specimens, I suggested to her, as long as you have the drawers out, have a look at as many fossil primates as you can and record their crown types, and we can do something with them later, and later arrived. And then finally, um, talking with Yuka at a meeting, um, actually I think it might have been in Calgary in 2017, um, we were talking about work that resurrecting the crown types using Nava's data, and it was Yuka who suggested that we um, crown type lowers and we come up with a way to compare the diversity of the front half of the tooth, lower tooth, with the back half of the lower tooth. And because of differences in height, which I'll explain in just a bit, um, we can actually use that to um, test methods of developmental timing. Um, so let's have a look at that. So um, this is Yuka's work from 2000. Um, Yuka and it primarily does, um, how do I say, um, experimental studies on tooth development in voles, mice, vole mice hybrids, basically high-tech high stuff in the lab. Um, but he also dabbles around with comparative morphology, too. Um, and in 2000, um, partly on the developmental work and partly on 
looking at patterns of variation in a living population of seals, um, landmarked ring seals um, from Finland, um, he was able to test some developmental hypotheses that basically um, teeth start to develop first from the highest cusp. Enamel, uh, the enamel dentine junction, or the ep dental epithelium, I should say, folds downwards at a rate that's determined by the relative uh, proliferation of cells in the epithelium as compared to the proliferation of mesenchyme um, inside the cusps, which is an, an embryonic um, uh, connective tissue inside, and they're controlled separately. But depending on the balance of epithelial growth versus mesenchymal growth in the middle, um, you can have a sharp cusp or you can have a blunt cusp. And depending on whether it's sharp or blunt, um, it ends up determining when and where the next cusps downslope form. And the reason why is because this little area where the first cusp forms is a special little area in the epithelium called the enamel knot. It produces um, proteins that suppress growth of itself, but promote growth downstream. And there's a uh, kind of inhibition zone around the enamel knot that prevents a new cusp from forming until you get a sufficient distance away on the epithelium, and then you get a new cusp. And then the whole process starts anew, and then you can get more cusps or not. And, but the alt, and then finally, tooth morphogenesis ends with um, the cessation of growth and root formation happens, and that's the end, and that's the size your tooth is. And so basically, depending on the balance between promoters and inhibitors of growth, you can end up with sharp cusps, which tend to grow downwards, excuse me, the sharp cusps here, which tend to grow downwards at a faster rate, and then you have fewer of these accessory cusps. Or they are blunt cusps that grow more slowly, and you have enough time to form accessory cusps before, um, the, before the chance to form them ends. And that means there's a correlation between the overall shape of the crown and the probability of finding extra cusps. And with these extra cusps down at the bottom being the more variable ones, and that's the key. Now this model that Yuka tested using two-dimensional teeth, basically, seals, where all the cusps are arranged in a single plane, um, with colleagues in anthropology at, at um, Ohio State, I've been able to extend that approach to human dentitians as well, and they follow the same basic rules. Um, but in terms of fossil primates and other fossil mammals in general, we're just going to focus on primates initially, is that here, here is a, a set of lower molars, and, and this comes from the work of Doug Boyer, um, paleoprimatologist. Um, and the back half of the tooth is the talonid, the front half of the tooth is, trigo is the trigonid. The trigonid is phylogenetically older, and so the oldest mammals have a trigonid, and the talonid is a new addition, first initially as a extra little blade, and then a full-blown crushing basin in um, the last common ancestor of Therian mammals. But the earliest primates tend to have uh, a, rather, a rather low talonid compared to the trigonid. And through time, uh, through primate evolution, and this is paralleled in other mammal groups as well, the talonid gets bigger, taller, and um, more in line with the cusp heights of the trigonid. Now, what that means developmentally is that the talonid, when the talonid is low, you can infer that it forms later. When the talonid is high and, and the cusp of the same height as the trigonid, you can infer that the talonid was formed, at, the talonid cusp formed at about the same time as the trigonid cusp. So there's less of a disparity in their time of formation. And the hypothesis that we wanted to test is that it was whether there was a difference, e, this difference in variation, where we expect greater variability in talonic cusps, whether that played out over evolutionary time into greater patterns of diversity attained within a diversification of primates. Are talonic cusps more diverse? Are talonids more diverse than trigonids? And so we had the data, we had the question, and it was a matter of cranking through some quick analyses. 
Uh, a little bit about primates. Um, uh, these North American primates uh, were around for about 30 million years in terms of their ecology, the small to medium-sized mammals. Uh, they kind of span um, insectivores at the primitive end. Uh, there's the evolution of some frugivory and maybe even some folivory among some of the more derived ones in North America. They're pretty much all arboreal or thought to be arboreal. And so for me, this, they kind of made a good case study independent of the archaic ungulates that I had studied earlier by these methods. Um, but basically, primates are doing in the trees what the condylarths were doing on the ground in some ways. Um, and in terms of systematics, um, there's about um, 10 families of archaic plesiodapiforms and three families of eu primates that are demonstrably closer to living, uh, uh, living primates. And actually, there's some structure in here. Some of these plesiodapiforms are undoubtedly closer to these eu primates than others, um, which this little classification doesn't reflect. Okay, the data, um, the taxonomic data come from the paleobiology database, a download of occurrences. Um, there was about 200 or so species to work with. And in terms of generating new uh, or, or adapting the crown typing system to lowers and to expanding it to uh, encapsulate um, both trigonids and telonids, um, we introduced a new crown type variable, um, a central cusp position. And crown types were determined separately for trigonids and telonids. Um, and the time intervals for temporal trends is still pretty coarse. We used land mammal ages, which vary in duration, honestly, but um, on average, they're about three million years on average. But on the short end, about one million years for the Puerkin land mammal age, the first one. Um, so there's some variation. Now today, I'll focus in on just three things, some basic observations about sampling, since um, so much of our perception of evolution in the fossil record is determined by what we get and what the sampling is like. What are some of the basic temporal trends and then those trigonid versus telonid patterns, which were the reason why we undertook this study. Um, in terms of sampling, um, the crown types are related to the numbers of species in each group, in each family that we crown type, not surprisingly. So we're still pretty much in the early stages of sampling. It's, it's analogous to going to the St. Mary River Formation where little is known versus the Hell Creek Formation, which is where a lot is known. And the likelihood of finding new stuff where little is known is much greater. And that's kind of where we're at right now with these, uh, with these primate crown types, where the, um, the more species we sample, the more crown types we get. We've also, um, because primates have a lot, show a lot of evolution in their premolars. We also extended the technique to premolars, which we had not done before. So we have data for third and uh, the last two premolars and the first two molars. But um, one of the observations you can make is that the, the gen, aside from the general relationship between numbers of species that you, that you crown type and the number of crown types you find, there's some, there's some variation and there's some families that depart from the main trend that seem to have fewer crown types than you would expect, depending on the tooth position, uh, based on the numbers of species. So there may be some constrained diversification in some of these groups for some of the tooth positions, and that merits further study. Uh, in, ter we, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, other methods of looking at or teasing information out of the crown types beyond simply counting up the number of crown types, you can also ca calculate what we called crown type disparity measures, which tell you how different uh, the crown types are from each other in terms of how many steps it would take to transform one crown type to another crown type. Um, this is done with essentially what's called city block distance or Manhattan distance, some, called, some call it, and total range, which is basically taking the total variance or total range of variation, I should say, in each crown type variable and summing it. And that, those are methods that are used in morphological diversity studies for these kind of discrete data. Um, and what we found looking at disparity is the most interesting thing to, to come out. Well, the overall pattern is that disparity seems to be very similar through the tooth row from the third premolar through the second molar. Trigonids and telonids seem to have similar disparity depending, uh, no matter what tooth you're looking at. But there's one standout, which is that um, the trigonid disparity of the 
fourth premolar is super, super um, high, both in um, city block distance and total range. But that outstanding um, uh, high value in the middle of the tooth row is entirely due to one family of primates, the carpalestids. Now, carpalestids have, and this is work from Chris Beard, this particular photo. Um, there's the molars. There's an expanded bladed premolar. Here's the outside. There's the inside view. Um, these expanded premolars um, mimic what we see in multituberculates with a, it's called a plagiolacoid premolar. We can also see it today in certain marsupials like Barami's. Um, and it's often thought to be related to um, breaking down hard resistant food items by concentrating forces into um, uh, high stresses, high stress points on the food. Um, but in any case, there's a great variety in fourth premolar shape in the carpalestids. And if you remove carp carpalestids, um, uh, if you remove carpalestids, that anomalously high value kind of goes away. So I think the disparity measures up to this point or at this point are very interesting for pointing out um, where some groups show interesting differences from other groups. And that's important. Um, but now the temporal trends, which is what I was really interested in myself because I'm interested in time as a paleontologist. And again, we're dealing a bit with sampling. So the number of primate species is shown to rise through the Paleocene and, and uh, to a peak in the early Eocene and fall through the middle and later Eocene until ex they become locally extinct in North America. Um, and there is this dip in the Clark Forkian land mammal age, which may be real or may be sampling artifact or maybe a combination of both. The Clark Forkian is not as well sampled uh, in terms of numbers of collections or outcrop area or numbers of publications or anything in comparison to the Tiffanian land mammal age before in the late Paleocene or the Wasatian land mammal age in the early Eocene, which is super well sampled. Um, and so uh, on the other hand, this is a time of reorganization, climate change, uh, the end Paleocene thermal maximum, the dispersal into North America of all sorts of groups, including you primates. So maybe a bit of this dip is um, real. And while I asked at the, meeting, at the SVP meetings, Mary Selcox for her opinion, is it real or is it an artifact? She just shrugged her shoulders. Um, so it bears further study. But in any case, um, the, the numbers of crown types generally reflects the numbers of primate species through time. It's a little bit more muted. So we're getting from the points of crown types redundant species. I suppose you could look at it that way. And we still get the Clark Forkian dip in the middle of the big um, hump. Um, and so if it's sampling or if it's real, it's affecting crown types as well as species, though not as much as species. And you can break down the temporal trend into the individual families, um, not surprisingly. Uh, and you can see which primate families are contributing to the Paleocene peak versus the Eocene peak, of course. the um, uh, the plesiodapa forms predominantly contribute to the Paleocene peak, but not all of them. Um, was, well, there's a paramamayid contribution to the Eocene peak, um, and, and um, these are the main um, U primates, which don't even appear in North America until the Eocene, so they're, they're stuck in there. But what's interesting is when you break things down into trigonid versus telonid patterns. Um, and so the red lines represent telonids, the blue lines trigonids. Uh, the molars on the right, um, M1 above, M2 below. The premolars on the left, P3 here, P4 here. And in the case of the premolars, uh, telonid diversification outstrips trigonid diversification early on in the Paleocene. And that's not surprising because you're starting off with a much, much lower telonid. Um, and so there's more room to grow, more room for diversification. Um, and trigonid um, diversification in the P3 and the P4 basically catches up to telonid diversification by the late Eocene, by mid to late Eocene. And then by that point, we're dealing with a telonid that's 
nearly as high as the trigonid and expected to have similar variation and potentially similar disparity as well. With uh, molars, it's a little bit more subtle, but you've got at least a, um, an earlier um, sort of a head start in telonid diversification in the M1. Uh, becomes less clear in the M2. Um, but really, if anything, what was the big surprise to me, anyway, um, learning about the detailed anatomy of these animals actually for the first time, and vicariously through my student, is how much is going on in the premolars. So the premolars are really the hot spots for um, uh, primate morphological evolution, um, which actually reflects some of the results that my student Nava got with some more sophisticated methods on various lineages of primates as well. The premolars are where it's really, where it gets really interesting. Um, and then as far as telonid and trigonid patterns in the whole data set, where we could have you know, collapse time, look at all the taxa mushed up together, um, some interesting patterns emerged. With the P3s, the third premolar, uh, we certainly have more telonid crown types than trigonid crown types overall, um, more than double. So that convinced me about the premolars, or the P3s. P4s and molars show a different pattern. What happens is that the numbers of crown types, numbers of telonid crown types, is similar to the numbers of trigonid crown types, and they cannot be distinguished that way. But what comes different is the distribution of species, uh, primate species, across these crown types. And borrowing a tool from ecology in studying diversity today. Um, today, when, when we go to communities and ask how diverse is a community, we look at numbers of species, and we look at the abundance of species, the abundance of, of individuals across those species. And there's a general sense that a more um, evenly distributed um, uh, distribution of species, uh, well, if, if these were individuals, a more even distribution of individuals across species would be more diverse, and a less even or, or um, uh, with, uh, distribution of individuals across species would be less diverse. It's the evenness component of diversity. Applying that at this scale, substituting species for individuals and crown types for species, what we're getting is a rather uneven distribution of species across crown types in the trigonid, that is, there's usually one trigonid crown type that dominates and a bunch of other ones that don't, that are only um, present in one or a few species. Whereas um, there's more of an even distribution of species across crown types in the telonid, where there's, a, in other words, there's a, a, a several species that sort of co-dominate or share species and then a long tail. Um, it's not a normal distribution, but it's very similar to the kind of distributions you obtain when looking at species abundance profiles in living communities. And that pattern continues when you go from the P4, the fourth premolar, to the molars. Again, uneven distribution of species across trigonid crown types, more even distribution of species across talonid crown types, and it continues, it gets kind of boring, it continues in the, in the second molar as well with that uneven distribution across trigonid crown types, more even distribution across telonid crown types, um, with similar numbers of crown types actually present. Um, so it's, it depends on how you look at diversity, um, and no one before us had looked at diversity, morphological diversity in quite this way before that I am aware of, um, but it's just another aspect of diversity that one puts into one's toolkit if you're interested in um, diversification patterns through time. So just to sort of conclude this in the last part of the, um, the talk, um, crown types, uh, we believe, are, um, are a, should, should be a toolkit along with all the other methods for assessing diversity, and they have some advantages in that they're quick. Um, you can do broad temporal and taxonomic sampling in a really brief time and they're accessible to everyone who has at least a basic understanding of teeth. Um, but, uh, sampling is just as important with these crown types as it is with sampling species through time. 
And so as our sampling improves, um, we're gonna be able to say more. Um, and um, finally, the, um, as far as temporal trends and the, um, is the evolutionary diversity greater for the Talonid and then the Trigonid, at this point, it seems to, there seem to be some interesting patterns emerging, um, but not quite the way we expected. For example, we find a stronger temporal signal in the premolars rather than the molars. And um, for the Talonids versus Trigonids in terms of diversity, we have to look a little bit deeper than the numbers of crown types or how different they are and look at how the species themselves are distributed across them. So I think, uh, so I'm gonna stop there.